Well, welcome to our Managing Through Crisis Summer Series presented by Michigan State University's Bro College of Business. My name is Marcy Stoll. I'm the Assistant Director of Executive Development at MSU. Today, we're presenting on the various impacts of crises on human resource management. So first, Dr. Hollenbeck will share his insights with you. And second, I will share your questions with him. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions throughout the presentation today. I will share as many of your questions as I can as time allows with Dr. Hollenbeck during the second half of the webinar. After we conclude today, this is for you to note, we will provide a link to a recording of the webinar, which will be posted on the Bro College YouTube channel. And now I would like to introduce you to Dr. David Freyer, the Assistant Dean of Outreach and Engagement. Dr. Freyer, thank you for being here today and thank you for continuing to support this community outreach initiative. Uh, thank you very much, Marcy. It's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, for everyone, uh, welcome to you. On behalf of uh, Dean Gupta and the Broad College of Business, we're really excited to have you with us today for this fourth uh, session in our summer series. I'm really pleased to have uh, Dr. John Hollenbeck with us. John is a, uh, a prolific researcher, prolific faculty member. He has really, in many ways, uh, defined and redefined so much uh, of the human resource discipline for all of us. And we're grateful uh, that he is willing to uh, take some time and share some insights with us uh, related to uh, COVID-19 and how it's having impact on so much of the work that we do. Um, John has uh, really been a, a tremendous support for all of us in the executive programs area, working with us on many, many open enrollment and custom programs. And I think one of the great things about uh, being involved with the Broad College is the idea that um, regardless of what your challenges and issues are as an organization, uh, you have an opportunity to reach out to us and see if there are ways that we can help you uh, move your culture, uh, move your organizational capabilities, redefine metrics, uh, so many things that uh, we can do. And, and Dr. Hollenbeck has been absolutely instrumental in so many of those programs for us. And so John, uh, with that, I'm grateful. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your insights. And we look forward uh, to hearing your comments about COVID-19 and the uh, HR curriculum. Thanks for being here, John. Uh, thank you, Dave, for having me and uh, welcome everybody. Um, what I'd like to do today, I'd like to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. That's my intention. Uh, sometimes my intentions uh, don't get translated into behavior. So if I talk for two hours, you'll know that that wasn't my intention. So I apologize. Uh, today, I really want to talk about COVID-19 and the HRM curriculum. I want to organize this around a book, as you see there, the Human Resource Management, Gaining Competitive Advantage. This is an HR textbook that I've written with several colleagues. Uh, this book has a 2020 uh, copyright on it. Um, and it doesn't have a single word about COVID in it. Um, we showed you the speed with which this thing has developed. Uh, we're currently writing the 13th edition of uh, the book because you might ask, wow, how do you get to 13 editions of a book? Uh, and there's two keys to that. Number one, be old. Uh, and as you can see, I'm old. Uh, the second thing is do editions uh, every two years. And because we're on a two year cycle, that really allows us to get into quickly into things. And I will tell you the 13th edition is going to have a case on COVID in every single chapter, um, which shows you how the big impact that this has had at HR. What I'd like to do is walk you through today several of the cases that we're working on uh, to give it to you in advance, uh, because again, a 2020 copyright book doesn't even have anything in it, but the 2022 will. And so we'll give you a sneak peek to that, and then hopefully open it up to your Q&A. Obviously, we have written extensively on this, uh, and you'd be able to, to, to read this 600-page book anytime you want. Uh, the beauty of something like this, though, is the Q&A. So hopefully I can get through this quickly uh, and then set you kind of up for Q&As. Um, first, uh, our book is very much about competitive advantage, how you use HR practices to gain advantage over uh, people in your industry. Uh, and we just can't emphasize enough that there's real no HR playbook uh, for something like COVID. Uh, we're all kind of learning on the run here, both at work and at home. Um, I've been quarantined. I was talking today before we started since uh, March 11th. I know the date exactly. I've been quarantined since March 11th. Uh, my wife and I have a house on Lake Michigan and we've been living there. And I told my wife that I feel so lucky that the one person in the world that I would most want to be quarantined with, uh, you know, I get to be quarantined with. And, and my wife said, 
that must be nice. Um, so anyway, we're all learning uh, about a lot of things. Uh, and the fact that there's no HR playbook here uh, for me and in our book uh, creates opportunities. Um, if something is a playbook and everybody does everything the exact same way, there's no real competitive advantage of that. The competitive advantage comes in when all of a sudden uh, you're not exactly clear what the, the, the right thing is to do. Uh, and then the companies that make the right move uh, gain competitive advantage. Uh, so there's no script for a lot of these things. We're kind of learning as we're kind of going through. Uh, but I also emphasize this is a time for identity and self-expression. Uh, every generation kind of gets its challenges. This is, might be the challenge for this generation. Uh, and uh, your identity is going to be tested. And we're going to talk about this is an opportunity for you to kind of express uh, who you are because there's no prototype for this. Uh, we're all kind of in a habit now of signing off with be safe and be well. Um, so today I want to talk about adding uh, be your best self uh, to the end of that, especially if you're dealing with human resources during this time. So be well, be, be safe, be well, and be your best self uh, and what that kind of means in, in HR. So I kind of walk through some of the uh, chapters and some of the things that we're working on to give you a, uh, a overview of the things that we're looking at and then open it up to your questions. Um, the book is organized into several different sections, uh, the HR environment, acquisition and preparation, assessment and development, compensation and special topics. I'm gonna look at one chapter within each one of those different uh, sections of the book, just to give you some broad coverage of some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, first thing I'll talk about is uh, many companies are kind of rethinking H, uh, HR and in particular issues related to offshoring. Um, in some cases, uh, an incident like COVID takes uh, trends that are already moving in one direction and just pushes them out a lot faster. And I think that's where we are with globalization. I really think there's already been a little bit of backlash against that. If you think about uh, uh, Britain breaking out, uh, if you think about Brexit, if you think about immigration challenges in the United States, um, there's already a little bit of pushback on this, but I think COVID's really pushed it out uh, kind of further. Um, many of our supply chains were built to be very, very efficient. Um, and because they're very, very efficient, sometimes they're not very redundant. And what we're seeing is, as the symbol there is the butterfly. And if you're familiar with the butterfly effect, the butterfly flaps its wings and the next thing you know, there's a tsunami. Uh, well, what we're learning about offshoring is that um, somebody eats a bat in China and the next thing you know, the global economy shut down. So a lot of people now are kind of looking at um, globalization in terms of trying to build in redundancy. Uh, there are some products that are uh, of imminent national security uh, to the United States that are not built in the United States. Uh, they're built in China. And all of a sudden people are questioning that. Uh, PPE is uh, protective uh, equipment for doctors and nurses. Obviously there are shortages of that. Uh, very little of that is made in the United States. Uh, and now people are kind of rethinking, uh, rethinking a lot of these particular issues. Uh, in the book, one of the examples that we're going to uh, follow is the case of Apple. Um, Apple is heavily, heavily invested in China in terms of uh, indirect employees uh, versus Samsung. Uh, Samsung is a company that is in India, it's in South Korea, it's in Vietnam, and it has a lot more uh, redundancy in those. Uh, even before COVID, Apple had experiences because of the tariffs uh, that all of a sudden they were subjected to tariffs because all their work was in China that perhaps Samsung wasn't uh, subject to. It's just an immediate form of kind of competitive advantage. Uh, now Apple is really looking to um, try to uh, try to at least reduce, uh, again, the number of employees they have, they can't turn that off, but they're trying to reduce it. Uh, and they're trying to re um, even do some manufacturing as hard as it is to believe. Uh, Apple is actually thinking of building uh, the next Mac in uh, the United States. Um, well, if you count Texas as being part of the United States, uh, Austin, Texas is going to be uh, the contract for uh, the Mac Pro. So a lot of cases we're seeing uh, companies that have very, very efficient, far-flung uh, supply chains um, are now kind of rethinking that and say, okay, we may have to introduce some lack of efficiency uh, to create some redundancy so that we're all not tied into 
uh, one specific basket of um, uh, work for employees or processes uh, at any one point. Um, next thing I've talked about is testing, tracing, and treating. This comes in our uh, HR preparation. Um, like it or not, I think we're going to see employers in the business of doing respiratory health testing. Uh, currently, this is, falls within the domain of public health, um, but I definitely think we're going to be seeing this moved in. Um, many, many people are looking at COVID and saying, um, you could never see this happening. It was impossible to anticipate this. Uh, but again, I'm kind of old. Uh, where were you for the swine flu? Where were you for MERS? Where were you for, for SARS? Uh, but to think that this is not going to happen again just goes against everything we know. Uh, and not only does the swine flu, MERS, SARS, uh, every time they get worse. Uh, and it's probably unlikely uh, that this isn't going to pop up again. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit about contact tracing, how contact tracing works in the area of public health, and then how many employers are trying to use contact tracing to uh, respond quickly to outbreaks. Um, because as we've seen, you can't have a, a, a hand grenade solution to this. It's, you don't want to shut down both Iron Mountain and Detroit at the same time if they're experiencing wildly different rates of infection. Uh, you don't want to shut down the whole country. And so we're moving to a system uh, where you're looking for kind of hot spots and contact tracing is the method. Um, talk a little about the state of Massachusetts. If you don't know anything about contact tracing, how this basically works. Um, if I test positive uh, for COVID, uh, I'm going to get a call. And it's going to be from a contact tracing team. And the call is from somebody who's called an alpha. And this is typically a healthcare worker. And that healthcare worker is going to work with me to try to figure out who are the people that I was in contact to uh, with within six feet uh, within the last uh, uh, five to seven days. Now I will report uh, my first degree contacts. Uh, those first degree contacts are then passed out to a contact tracer who takes those first degree contacts and then repeats the process, tries to find out who those people have been in contact with. Now, these are all organized around telephone numbers and as you can see this, and I've got a picture of the social network uh, on this particular slide, um, each individual tracer is basically creating a social network where the source of COVID is at the center of the network. You get their first degree uh, relationships and then their second degree relationships. So each person is plotting an individual network. Now, within the state of Massachusetts, we have visualization technology that allows us that if any two tracers hit the exact same telephone call, perhaps coming from different angles, okay, to the extent that those now get connected, um, those individual networks get uh, merged together. And now if a third person hits the telephone number, the same telephone number, this comes together. Notice you have a situation where each one of the tracers is working alone. Many of them are not even in Massachusetts. Uh, they're working alone from their own computer and yet building their own individual mental models at the end we can step back and create the entire mental model and see where is this uh, these can be color coded for how uh, recent they are uh, and you can see where these networks kind of come together this is how we found out for example in east lansing michigan that one bar harper's has generated over 180 uh, COVID cases uh, contact tracing basically found that this was kind of a hot spot for that. Uh, organizations are increasingly getting into the contact tracing business. Uh, they will be taking temperatures of people as they come into their room. Uh, this is a Bluetooth sensor. A uh, Bluetooth sensor basically allows you to detect anytime two people come within six feet of each other and it can set off an alarm to indicate that you're six feet uh, from someone and maybe you want to get further away. But it also logs that so if I ever um, tested positive, uh, they would have an objective record of everybody that I was within six feet of. Uh, and because these can be attached to base stations, uh, you can actually know kind of where these uh, take, uh, where those interactions take place. So uh, the public health model is not exactly how employers are going to be do th doing this, but I do think as part of the general um, move towards wellness and the general movement towards our respiratory health uh, employers are going to be kind of on the front line of this because uh, you can't shut down, just like you can't shut down the whole country. 
because of one or two hotspots. You don't want to shut down the whole state because of one or two hotspots. You can't shut down a really large organization either just because one of one or two hotspots. These things have to be managed. And this is how we create the balance between um, maintaining safety, but also kind of keeping the economy running, uh, the degree to which we can kind of manage contact tracing. In terms of HR development, one of the things that uh, we're developing a case on is more and more uh, companies are, are realizing that their employees need uh, help with remote working skills. Um, many people are working at home that weren't working be home before. And uh, like, um, like respiratory health, I don't think we're ever going back uh, to where we were before. I think uh, organizations are going to, even if we return to what whatever normal means, I think there's gonna be a lot more people working at home uh, as part of kind of hybrid systems where they're home half the time, they're at work half the time, uh, they're um, working remotely uh, in different teams at, at different times. I'm not 100% sure that we're gonna go be going, going to be going back. Um, but here I wanna talk, my, my focus is here is on, on broadcasting and multi-team systems and particularly team size. Um, many, base, many people really struggle uh, with things like Zoom. Um, for a lot of technical reasons, it doesn't really mimic human interaction in a, in a very accurate way. And so it's very cognitively stressing for people to work on it. But even if the technology is perfect, uh, one of the single biggest problems that organizations have with remote working deals with team size. And so I'm gonna throw some numbers at you today. So be ready for some numbers. The first number I wanna throw you at you is 4.6. Uh, 4.6 is the ideal perfect team size. That's four adults and a 14 year old. I really don't know what the 14 year old is supposed to be doing in that team. Uh, no, sorry. Um, but it's point six is to recognize that these can be bigger or smaller depending on how, how much time people have worked together. If people have worked together for a long time, you can get away with five, six, and seven person sized teams. Uh, but if teams are really relatively unfamiliar with each other, then four is, is a better number uh, than five. So with that as a number, what you're really trying to manage in terms of remote work is the degree to which um, the communication network and the communication links are manageable. And so now a couple of numbers. If you have a five person team, the formula for this is N times N minus one divided by two. And so a five person team has 10 communication links. That's not a lot of communication links to manage and people don't necessarily talk over each other. And this is the perfect kind of system that if you wanna have a problem solving team or an innovation team or a creativity team, this is the perfect size. They can work remotely. Five of them can work very, very effectively, six or seven, uh, if they're familiar with working each other because a lot of things go unsaid. And so you're turning off a lot of communication channels uh, because of that. But if you have a problem solving team of people that are unfamiliar, and now you're looking at closer uh, to, to N equals four. Now that doesn't mean we can't do things with large um, organizations. Broadcasting is a very important thing during COVID. Uh, a lot of really good leaders basically choose a time, let's say one o'clock on Monday, and they come on for just 15 minutes. 10 is, under 10 is too less, 20 minutes is too much. Uh, 15 minutes is the perfect time every week at a particular time, the leader of the organization comes on and says, here's what happened last week, here's what we're looking at this week. And by holding it to 15 minutes, uh, number one, it really focuses you to stay focused Number two, it makes it easy for people to interact as part of their day, and they can be taking notes and sending questions to the leader after the thing's done that the person can work off uh, online. Um, but, and it also can be taped. So I know that if I was not able to be at the broadcast at one o'clock, I wanna see what my CEO or what my HR director or what my manager thinks about what happened last week and what's going on in this week and a quick 15 minute blurb, I can get it. This is so much more effective than the 25 page email that might come out every week because people aren't going to read it. Uh, but 15 minutes allows you to maintain their focus, maintains the connection between the leader of the organization and the rest of the organization, and somehow try to manage the culture and the shared experience that everybody has uh, in a context where everybody's working from a different kind of place. So there's definitely a place for remote teams when you have a five person team, definitely a place for broadcasting. The other thing I wanna talk about before we leave this section is the idea of a multi-team system. A multi-team system is something, what do you do when you have, maybe you want 15 or 25 people? Because for a five person team, 
That's 10 communication lengths. Now remember, the formula is n times n minus one divided by two. A 10 person team has 90 communication lengths. A 15 person team, uh, 105 communication lengths. A 25 person team, forget about it, okay? We are not gonna have 25 people working on a Zoom call in any productive fashion. And yet, if you use a multi-team system, you can get the benefits of a lot of size and a lot of scope without eating up the cost of that in terms of communication networks. But a multi-team system, how a multi-team system basically works um, is that there are five people. Uh, let's say you have a five, five people team, five, five person teams. Um, there is one person from each team represented that has a microphone and has a screen. Now behind that person is another five person team, uh, but they're not on screen and they're on mute and they can talk to the person that's on the screen. But you never have more than five people interacting face to face. Now there's 20, 30 people watching this. They can contribute to this, uh, but they can't get mic'd in. Now in a multi-team system, you as a person that's representing your team might decide, oh, Okay, this is getting to the point of specificity that I'm gonna step out and perhaps Dave Freyer is going to step in, but there's never more than five people uh, with active roles within the particular team. Uh, so a multi-team system is a way of kind of getting around um, the limits of team size and it's different from broadcasting and it's not the exact same thing as a five person team working alone, but it is an opportunity to create large specialized teams uh, that don't run into some of the problems associated, um, some of the problems associated with uh, overly large teams. Uh, turning to our chapters on compensation and collective bargaining, uh, one thing that I wanna talk about is uh, the impact of pay and the impact of collective bargaining units on a lot of the things that are happening. Um, first, in terms of pay, uh, you may or may not be um, familiar with what the unemployment insurance situation is in this country. Uh, but currently, the rate, the weekly rate for unemployment insurance is $978 a week, varies a little bit by state. Um, where did 978 come from? Uh, the number 978 come from the idea that this was what the average worker in the United States was making. Uh, and there was pressure to do two things, depend on who you talk to. Some people will say they put it at 978 because that's the average worker and they wanted to make sure that people didn't feel pressure to come back. So for example, if you were making $970 uh, a week and then you got COVID, there'd be an awful lot of pressure for you to keep coming to work uh, even though you shouldn't be coming to work. And so that was one possible reason. Uh, the other possible reason was the technology at the unemployment insurance uh, didn't allow you to set different rates for different people. Uh, so you can only choose one rate. What this means is that for 50% of people on unemployment insurance, they all got a raise. And, and for many of them, this was not a trivial raise, this was a significant raise. Now, loan forgiveness programs, a lot of these uh, employers are took out uh, government loans and they can get forgiveness, but the requirement of the forgiveness for these loans is that people get have to be back employed. So for example, Hoffman Car Wash, uh, to get their uh, loan forgiveness needs to get 500 of their employees uh, back to work. Now there's a lot of companies in this position, they need to hire their people back, but if you're making $978 a week and I'm asking you to come back to a job that pays $378 a week, uh, you may be reluctant uh, to drop everything and, and kind of come back. Um, currently, and maybe somebody in the audience knows this, if you do, please plug in. Uh, there's debate whether this 978 is going to be extended into the future or not. Uh, my understanding, and that understanding may be incorrect, is that the loan forgiveness programs end July 31st. Uh, and, and, and so we'll see if these things, uh, how these things overlap. But what's happening with this $1,000 a week, there are many workers in, in the United States that never really received $1,000 a week. And so many of them are um, kind of questioning uh, their willingness to work for $378 a week. Uh, and so there's gonna be a lot of wage pressure. Um, we're kind of finding out during um, COVID who's essential and who's not essential. Um, I get many, many memos to me that tells me that at Michigan State, I am a non-essential worker and I really need to be working from home. Uh, and then you can see who the essential workers are. 
uh, and many of the essential workers at Michigan State, and many of the essential workers um, in the U.S. economy are not making $978 a week. And so there's going to be increasing pressures uh, from pay structure point of view uh, to kind of deal with um, uh, people that uh, may be uh, more interested, more interested in moving from one job to the other, especially if you're an essential worker. Um, I think that we're definitely going to see wage pressures uh, associated with that, which kind of leads us to the last one, uh, union drives and public relations. Oh, uh, Hoffman Car Wash. Uh, Hoffman Car Wash, I want to use that as an example because basically this is a company that did receive a large uh, loan. Uh, they also needed to get their employees back. Um, in many cases, the uh, requirements for a car wash don't even allow you to work inside the car with multiple people. Uh, so a lot of that work can't get done. Uh, and so what Hoffman Car Wash did in order to get their loan forgiveness, they hired all their employees back. They basically took the loan that they were given, gave it directly to the employees just to keep them on payroll with the idea that uh, once everything um, smooths out, uh, these employees will be loyal to them and then be able to rehire these employees back. So it's an example of kind of a company that's kind of looking forward and trying to uh, take care of the employees in a way that those employees would be there for them uh, when the time comes. Uh, switch to union drives and public relations. Uh, and again, this gets to who's essential and who's not and supply and demand. And a really good, good example here is Amazon. Uh, during COVID, the demand for certain kinds of products, for example, toilet paper, uh, dog food, uh, webcams, uh, canned food in general, ping pong tables. Who would think ping pong tables? Uh, the demand for certain products went up 500%. Uh, and so Amazon was under a tremendous amount of uh, demand. Uh, the supply was a lot of their workers were getting sick. Uh, a lot of their workers didn't feel that the working conditions were safe in terms of putting them in close proximity of a lot of people. Uh, and so we saw walkouts, uh, we saw um, work stoppages, and we saw union drives. Uh, now Amazon is a very kind of anti-union company um, but we saw a lot of union drives um, and they have done a lot of concessions in terms of janitorial staff. They've done a lot of concessions in terms of pay. They've hired a lot of temporary workers. They really are trying to support uh, the workforce in a way to perhaps not get a union. Um, however, there's a lot of pressure there. And here's where we kind of get to the issue of HR identity and, and self-expression. Uh, one thing that came out, and I want to read my notes because I want to get this uh, I want to get this exactly correct. Um, uh, David Saplowski, who is the senior vice president in terms of um, uh, the company's general counsel, um, one of the people who was leading the boycotts is a gentleman named uh, Chris Smalls. Uh, and Chris Smalls was someone that they wanted to make the face of the movement. And in a meeting that was tape recorded, uh, David Sapolsky says, uh, we should, we should um, make Mr. Smalls, Mr. Smalls is not smart or articulate. And he is a useful tool in our ongoing plan to prevent unionization efforts. We should spend the first part of our response strongly laying out the case for why the organization's, why the organizer's conduct was immoral and acceptable and arguably illegal and only follow up after that, follow up with our usual talking points about worker safety, okay? Um, we talk about identity and self-expression. Personally, I would not wanna be attached uh, to anything so horrible uh, as that. Now, Mr. Zaposky, in, in his defense, did apologize. Uh, he came out later and after this was published in the Wall Street Journal, came out and apologized and said, he said that in a moment of anger. And he says, that does not those comments do not express who I really am as a person. We'll let the reader decide, okay? But we're at a time now where leaders are under a microscope, uh, that this might be the challenging definition for our generation, like World War II was for previous generations, like uh, the Depression was for previous generations. Uh, leaders are gonna be under a magnifying glass, and this is an opportunity for you to really express who you are. Um, and so when I say be safe and be well and be your best self, uh, this is what we need during this time period, not just from HR leaders, but from leaders uh, at the top of the organization, 
leaders of families, leaders of community. Um, all of us need to be our best self because our best self is going to be needed um, as we go through the next uncertain times. Uh, if you've watched COVID go up and down, uh, we have no idea uh, where this is going. Um, we're all in this together and that's why you need to be your best self. Uh, now with that, I will open this up to questions and answers about uh, anything that might be related to HR curriculum issues uh, and COVID. Great, we have some questions coming in and I'll encourage you to submit your questions if we're not covering what you would like us to while we go through the next several minutes. So Dr. Hollenbeck, the first question I have is on expense reduction. Um, there's a possible permanent expense reduction needed for the company so or the organization. So this viewer asks, please address compensation such as pay cuts, staff reductions, cutting benefits. My company is a 501c6 and we have no access to PPP, the Performance Partnership Program. We will likely see a permanent reduction in revenue. So I'm likely going to need to reduce expenses permanent, permanently. So can you please address her um, question or comment on compensation and how that's impacted by crises? Yeah, number one, you're basically facing some hard choices here. Uh, and these hard choices can go in a couple of different directions. Uh, number one, I'll give you an example at Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State, we're all taking, people are taking pay cuts. Uh, I'm taking a 5% pay cut uh, in my salary. I'm taking a 5% pay cut in my retirement fund. Uh, and in Michigan State, that's graded um, from seven, six, five, four, three, two percent depending upon where you are. So Michigan State's made a strategic choice and the strategic choice is they don't wanna separate people. Even the people that perhaps they feel like they have to separate, they're putting in a furlough program. And the furlough program allows you to maintain your current benefits, um, but you're not necessarily getting paid. But the idea is when things turn around, hopefully the workers that are furloughed, you could get them back again. Uh, and so one, uh, the notion that people can't take a pay cut or that we have to reduce salaries, um, this is just something that's no longer true. Now, the alternative to that is maintain the salaries and cut positions. Uh, and therefore you go in, and again, this can be strategic, uh, where you decide, okay, who really are the core employees? We're gonna protect the core employees and whoever are not core employees, uh, we're gonna cut costs uh, at that particular point right there. Uh, much more brutal. Um, the worst of all worlds, if you do that kind of strategy, but you do it, let's say by tenure or seniority, because then that's not strategic at all. You lose some of your best, youngest talent, um, and it's just simply not strategic. So I guess the answer to your question is, you know, from a competitive advantage point of view, how much do you compete through the workforce? And if the workforce is central to your competitive advantage and getting things done, that you've got to be very strategic about how you maintain that. Um, and asking people to take pay cuts, even if it's temporary or if it's not temporary, we're in a brave new world. I mean, this is like World War II. Uh, and so that's part of it. Um, if you feel like the top talent in your organization uh, can't take that, that all of a sudden you reduce some, someone's salary and then they, because they're skilled, they take a job in another place, uh, that's costly too, I will say. That during COVID, it's not that easy uh, to move from one job to another. Uh, so if you do take a pay cut and you do want to move, it's kind of a sticky time to try to be moving. Um, so I, I do think pay cuts and benefits cuts are a, a way to um, reduce the number of permanent layoffs uh, that you have to engage in. Uh, but And furloughs present a buffer between um, permanently laying someone off and paying them, but at least they get benefits. Uh, and so furloughs are an option. Um, but in the end, it really depends on what your strategy is. Some organizations are going to keep, uh, are not going to do pay cuts. They're really going to commit themselves to what they consider their core employee group is that helps them maintain their advantage and downsizing areas where they feel it's not central. Uh, other companies are going to try to not downsize. They're going to try to keep a, a broad uh, swath of people employed and you just simply can't, the money's got to come from somewhere. And so the way that comes from, it comes from pay reductions uh, and they might be graduated pay reductions. 
I don't know what the experience is going to be at Michigan State in terms of, you know, will professors be up in, you know, up in arms and leaving over pay cuts? I honestly don't know. Um, I took a 5% cut, 10% if you count employee benefits, and I'm not looking. Um, I'm committed to Michigan State. Michigan State's been com committed to me. And I'm committed to the notion that we're going to do whatever we can to reduce the number of layoffs uh, and reduce you know, the number of furloughs. So it uh, really kind of depends on what your strategy is. You brought up a, a different point when you mentioned it's harder to transition now to a new job. So on the opposite end of you know this topic, there's a question from a reader that I want to insert right now or a viewer that asks, would you please share your thoughts on virtual interviewing versus in-person interviewing and the accuracy of finding the most qualified candidate that's the right cultural fit? Yeah, well, again, um, I'm an evolutionary psychologist. And so for evolutionary reasons, um, you lose a lot when you go from a three-dimensional, real life, face-to-face -face interview uh, and a uh, a Zoom interview, uh, you really lose a lot. I, I think in terms of, particularly if you're a skilled interviewer, in terms of picking up on body language, in terms of looking at, think, picking up things related to gaze, uh, picking up clues related to whether a person's kind of telling the truth or not, or whether somebody's exaggerating or not. I think if you're a really good interviewer, you can pick up a lot of these things in a real life face-to-face -to -face interview that you lose when you go to Zoom. Part of it's just the, 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 the lack of gaze, um, the head size is too big. There's just a lot of things that Zoom does not mimic real life human interaction. That's why it's often very fatiguing. Like if you've been on four or five Zoom calls, it's very fatiguing for, because cognitively your brain is having a hard time adjusting to uh, what it's seeing. Uh, and it, what it's seeing, it's not evolutionary adapted to uh, see what it's seeing. And so, number one, I do think you lose a lot. Uh, but uh, Zoom is a lot better than a telephone call. Uh, you lose a lot more in a telephone call. Uh, and Zoom is a lot better than reading somebody's, and a telephone call is better than reading somebody's resume. And so all of this is kind of on a continuum of, you know, what's perfect and what's, you know, less than perfect. Um, so in the end, I think, you know, you might want to use, um, you know, Zoom to, you know, get down to the very last candidate. And then perhaps once you have the candidate that you've chosen, uh, you just want to meet them once face to face, uh, you might be able to pull that off in a socially distant uh, context. But of course, that depends on whether the person has to fly out or not. If you have to fly somebody out, that creates a difficulty there. Um, so you lose a lot going from face to face to Zoom. There's no doubt about it. Uh, during today's uh, day and age. Um, I think people are finding it hard to move. Uh, I do think companies are reluctant to hire somebody kind of based on a Zoom interview, especially if the person's going to be hired on a Zoom interview and then they're not even going to work with us face to face, uh, but that we're always going to have this one-off kind of distant relationship with this person. We hired them in a distant way. Now they're going to be working in a distant way. I'm just finding a lot of organizations are uncomfortable uh, with that. And so I do think it's going to be kind of sticky and hard to move uh, during this time period. Yeah, it's definitely a new challenge where I don't think we have good answers yet. I think we're all attempting to make these shifts, but it's certainly a tougher part of the uh, all of the challenges that we're going through right now, which actually ties into the next question. We had a question about the ideal training environment in a virtual setting. What's your advice on the right number of people to have in a virtual training environment, which is a live presentation with live interaction with the students or participants? Well, again, what we're looking at here is the numbers that we're looking at is the number of communication links. So my first question is, are the students going to be talking to each other? Let's say that the students are not going to be talking to each other, but that you want to have a trainer talking to a larger group of people than five. Okay. To the extent that you turn off the communication links between the students, then all of a sudden now you can have 15, 20 people in there because there's only 15 communication links. They all go from the student to the trainer. You can't have 100 people in there because the trainer is not going to be able to manage questions coming at them from 100 people really. 
Um, and so that's kind of, uh, that makes that definitely more difficult. Uh, but if you want the students interacting together, that's a different ballpark. Okay, now if you go into Zoom, Zoom has a groups function. And so you could be talking to a group of let's say 25, and then those 25 can go off into their own Zoom rooms and talk and interact together. But it's very difficult for the trainer to be in those rooms simultaneously and seeing what's going on in those rooms simultaneously. Okay, so you can use a multi-team system to try to get that down. If you want to have one trainer, maybe 25 students, and those students interact offline, but the 25 cannot interact all together. Um, or you can treat it as a broadcast where the trainer talks and nobody uh, reacts other than through written Q&A like we're doing right now. Uh, again, you can do that. My understanding is we have 400 people, but there's a lot of people who are not going to get their questions answered today. Uh, let's be clear. Uh, so a broadcast really isn't that effective for that particular thing. So again, I'm always looking at the number of communication links. So in a broadcast, sure, you can do a broadcast maybe with 90 people. If you really want to take one-on-one uh, -on -one questions from people, then I think you're looking at 25 people. If you want the students talking to each other, then it's either five or six people or it's a multi-team system where you go back and forth between the trainer talking, then the students go off, and then the students all come back. Uh, but all 25 students aren't going to be talking uh, at once. Okay, thank you for that advice on uh, virtual training. And I want to ask one more question in the playbook, and then we'll move into testing, tracing, and treating. Um, so the last question that we have time for today in the playbook is on PTO. So this person states, prior to COVID, a tendency with an industry to offer unlimited paid time off was developing. How has that tendency been impacted by the pandemic? And do you anticipate it will retain importance as a recruitment and retention initiative? I'm sorry, did you say unlimited time off? I'm not sure I heard yeah, you. Yeah, unlimited time off. So this person is asking, has the pandemic shifted? Are we no longer going to see unlimited time off as a re, uh, recruitment, a piece of recruitment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with the heavy use of the term unlimited paid time off. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll hold that, uh, but I will talk about paid time off because in the area of COVID, this is it's essential. People have to be paid for not being there. Otherwise you create an incentive where they either try to hide their symptoms and come to work uh, because they need the money. Uh, and so paid time off is central to any kind of uh, contact tracing uh, situation. The key to contact tracing is it can't, the numbers can't get so large and expanding so fast that the tracers can't get their arms around it. And so if a bunch of people work are coming in at work knowing that they're sick, knowing that they're ill because they need the money, then you're very, very likely uh, to get into a situation where it gets out of hand and now you have to shut down the whole thing because you haven't been able to trace it. And one of the most alarming things I read is apparently there are parties going on in the South and one in Texas in particular where young people are getting together that have tested positive and they literally have a party to see if other people can get it because they think it's a hoax. And there was a very sad story in the New York Times about a young person that actually died because of that. Uh, and they said I made a horrible, horrible mistake. And, Indeed, uh, that's a horrible, horrible mistake. Yes, I noticed that if you don't give people paid time off, you're kind of sponsoring a party like that because it really puts the pressure on people to hide symptoms uh, or to, ah, oh, it's just a cold. It's just, it's not really, I'm not going to get tested. I'm sure I'm fine. Most people want to believe that they're fine. And so believing is seen. Um, and so they are going to make that mistake. Uh, now, unlimited time off, again, I'm not exactly sure where that comes from, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, paid time off is probably going to wind up increasing uh, just to keep employees safe and to keep employees from uh, getting other employees sick. Yeah, it's companies like Sony, Evernote, Dropbox, some, some more in the tech world. Um, tech industry that we're offering that unlimited paid off. It definitely has not made it its way around to higher ed yet. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have a chapter in our, or have to have a case in our <laughs> book about that. I'm going to look that up as soon as we're done for two reasons. Number one, if there's unlimited paid time off, 
that would be something that we need in our HR textbook. And number two, I just took a 5% pay cut. So I want to work in this company where I get unlimited time off and get paid. So I want to learn a little more about that, both individually as a person and as uh, somebody writing an HR textbook. So yeah, I will, well, I'm definitely going to look that I'm going to definitely look that up. Thanks. Good. I'll keep my eyes out for your next version. Then. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to switch over to, to testing, tracing, treating. Um, specifically talking about COVID and our re-entry plans in that topic that you mentioned partway through. So the first question is, how do we balance employee privacy with the need to contact trace or even institute activities such as temperature checks? Do you think this will be a big, become a bigger issue as we progress through the pandemic? Uh, it's, it's such a great question. Uh, and I could answer this in so many different ways. But I'm going to start uh, with uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, Health and Human Services uh, has released HIPAA requirements for any uh, tracing program that's at least partially aligned with a state public health agency. So number one, the HIPAA requirements that you're kind of familiar with, some of these have been slightly adjusted to allow for contact tracing because uh, that's a really big thing. So that's number one. Uh, if you're worried about HIPAA, uh, uh, contact tracing can be done within a HIPAA framework. So that's um, number one. Number two, how well do I know this person? Uh, because I understand their need for privacy, but my first question is, do you have a cell phone? Uh, because if you have a cell phone, you have no privacy. Um, do you have a Facebook page? If you have a Facebook page, you have no privacy. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to suggest it's quaint, um, but the notion that somebody would be sacrificing their privacy um, to, to be part of a contact tracing program, I'm not sure what privacy they think they have. Um, and that's a larger, larger scope uh, kind of conversation about how to get that privacy back uh, to some extent. They want their privacy. It has to. They have to get it back. Uh, it's. It's not that they're releasing it. It's already out. Uh, and we can talk about how to try to get that back. But from an employer's point of view, what's the minimum footprint that we can have, and get our job done? Uh, as an employer, you need to know if there's somebody at work that's got a temperature that's in the range of COVID, even if it's regular flu. And by the way, none of these things can detect COVID from the regular flu. But as an employer, do you really care? Do you really want somebody with the regular flu just walking around infecting people? Uh, I, I don't think you do. Uh, and so I, I do think um, it's a business necessity for you to know the health of uh, the workforce when it comes to an infectious disease. And yeah, you're gonna pay a little bit of a privacy cost there. Um, but I will tell you, I work at organizations now where again, people, have, people are wearing Bluetooth sensors as a condition of employment. People have RFID badges where every time they go through a door, they have to swipe a badge. Uh, I work at FRIP uh, uh, here on campus. Uh, if you go into FRIP, I don't think there's a single square foot of FRIP that there's not a camera. Uh, and so, uh, again, we're talking about taking a lot of the lack of privacy that we have now and using it strategically to help keep people safe. Um, and so, I, I definitely agree that the, the, the person has a concern with the erosion of privacy rights. To, in, in my opinion, that ship sailed uh, and we might try to get that ship back. Um, but given where that ship is, it doesn't seem unrealistic for employers to leverage whatever they can to keep their uh, workforce healthy and competitive. Let's shift gears a little bit to talking about working remotely. The first question we've heard and this listener asks, how does he help minimize burnout? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, because people are kind of experiencing a lot of burnout because of this, again, because Zoom is a very fatiguing thing for cognitive reasons. It's, it, and so number one, you really got to minimize your, me your meetings. And I think some of the things that we're learning now through COVID again, are gonna teach, teach us lessons that if we ever got back to a regular normal, we're not going to be the same, you know? 
Uh, I don't think we're ever going to be the same. I don't think we were the same after 9-11. We were permanently changed by 9-11. We were permanently changed by World War II. We were permanently changed by the Great Recession. I think we we're going to be permanently changed by COVID. But the things that we're talking about, multi-team systems, a lot of people, what people are realizing now is that they make teams that are too big. Even for real face-to-face -face interaction, the teams are too big. Uh, and because the teams are too big and there's so many communication requirements, it just adds work uh, and people have to show up at meetings that perhaps they don't really need to be at that meeting. They don't really need to be. You can't use the criteria, it might be nice to have this person at the room, or we might need the person at this room, because those are the kind of things that generate groups that are too big, even in face-to-face. -face. The question becomes, does, do we have to have this person? And to some extent, I think, this is forcing us to be careful about and, and disciplined about who should be in the meeting and who shouldn't because we got to minimize that number. And so overall, if we can just reduce the number of meetings that people have to go to, um, that will help with their burnout. I have this rule for, for a meeting. If you're not taking notes and if you didn't ask a question, you shouldn't have been there. Okay, that's a good test. And so if you find yourself at a bunch of meetings where you're not taking notes and you're not asking a question, you shouldn't be there. And somebody needs to get to whoever's building these teams and going, you know, this, this team is too big. Now you might want to have a list that after you people that you decide must be there, I want each of the people who must be there to think about who we might have needed here. And then those people might go back and contact the people that you might have needed and perhaps they could be at the meeting next time. But I think you need real discipline keeping team, uh, keeping meeting size down. Uh, for any of the people out there that are, um, you know, football fans, you know that there's a uh, uh, speakers and headphones and a quarterback's uh, helmet. Uh, now the entire coaching staff does not have access to that quarterback's helmet. We don't need 27 people. Some of these quarterbacks have been hit so hard and they're so concussed, they already have voices in their head. And so the last thing you need is 25 people trying to talk to this guy. There's one person, okay? And football teams struggle. Who is the one person we want talking to our quarterback? Why? And I think that's the way you've got to be with, it, with the meeting. With, who is the one, two, three people we must have? Uh, usually there's a boss, there's an information leader from several different teams. They need a technical leader to make sure all the technology works because there's nothing worse than a Zoom call where the technology all breaks down and you've got a bunch of high paid people sitting around doing nothing because the technology is not working. Every single Zoom session needs to have the person who's responsible for making sure this technology works perfectly and seamlessly. And so when it starts heading south, we're not all talking to each other about how to get your screen on. There's one person there dedicated to doing it. So there's the formal leader, there's the information leader, and there's the technical leader. Uh, and all these things can, can somewhat reduce the burnout of it. Now, the other part of the burnout that comes from COVID, people working at home, if you're a parent, if you're a parent working at home, now you've got children in the background running around. I just saw a story in the New York Times today about a a young woman who was a mother who got fired because so many of her Zoom meetings, three children were running around back behind them. That was considered unprofessional. And that person was actually terminated their employment because their inability to handle, you know, three kids under six working at home. Uh, as somebody who had four kids, all of whom were under six, uh, thank God COVID didn't happen uh, when I was a young person trying to work at home. But working at home when there's no schools, uh, you're balancing a lot of stuff simultaneously. You've got to be a parent. And, you know, some people have suggested, well, you can be a parent or you can be gainfully employed, uh, but you may, may not need, may not be both. Uh, and then part of it, if there's two, if, if it's, there's two people, if there's two people, you can do a certain kind of time sharing, two hours on, two hours off, basically kind of trading off who's the teacher today and who's the worker today during eight to 10 versus 10 to 12. If you're a single person, that's harder. And now if you're a single essential worker, which means you've got to work outside the home, snap. Um, yeah, a lot, of a, period, a lot of people are experiencing burnout during this time period. Uh, 
uh, and you, you got to somehow find a way to take care of yourself and anything that an employer can do to, to help people. Again, as an employer, how do you be your best self? How do you um, take care of the people that are critical to you in terms of getting your competitive advantage and being a successful organization? Um, yeah, it's a tough thing to balance. Yeah, and it's hard to separate. You have to have better boundaries because you're not leaving to go to work. Your work is within your home. So you need to practice or identify ways to separate your work from the rest of your, your personal life too. And again, for some workers, that's easier than others. If you yeah. live in a one bedroom apartment, that's one thing. But um, if you've got two workers living in a one bedroom apartment, uh, really, I mean, the other thing that's kind of this COVID is really making clear to people is kind of the, um, you know, economic inequality and who gets to work from home and who has to, to, does not get to work from home, who has the resources to work from home, who struggles to work from home because of lack of resources. Uh, and so again, it takes trends that are already kind of existing. And so I think there are a lot of trends in terms of income inequality that people are concerned about and it just pushes it further down the track. Uh, because it really exposes uh, the, the relative advantages um, that some groups have. We have time for two more questions. There's a lot more that we didn't get to as you predicted. Um, and diversity has come up from several different people and several different angles. Um, the question I do want to pose to you today is this. What are your thoughts around proxy advisory firms and investors push on accelerating diversity in executive ranks within companies and potentially penalizing or not investing companies that are behind? What advice can you provide on how companies can manage and be successful in this movement? Well, in terms of the diversity movement, I think there's two different kinds of cases that you make for it. Uh, there's the legal case and then there's the business case. And I think either one of those cases can kind of be successful, but because our book is about competitive advantage, I'll talk about the business case. Uh, because the business case for diversity, um, we can show you study after study that shows that teams, uh, whether it's a top management team or an operational team or an innovation team or a creativity team, in all of these contexts, diversity promotes problem solving, diversity promotes communicating, diversity uh, prevents uh, a great deal of things that might happen that look discriminatory. Again, if there's members of the group in the room, the group doesn't say things or do things that get them into trouble. And I wasn't gonna talk about this case, but now I will. Uh, one of the cases that we're developing in the book is about Adidas. And so I'll have your readers read about uh, the recent re uh, Adidas experience where they basically fired their HR chief. Uh, they have protests. And the problem at Adidas was basically it's a sneaker and, um, apparel company um, that for years, uh, the African-American employees there felt discriminated against. Uh, uh, if you looked at their uh, top management board, there were no African-Americans out of six. If you look at their 16 uh, people on their executive board, uh, zero out of 16 were black. Uh, less than 1% of the top 2,000 2, VPs were black. Uh, this was a company that had a discrimination problem. Now the irony is Adidas leverages the African-American community in their marketing and they market to African-American, they use African-American players in sports, they use African-American singers, they sell to African-American customers. Uh, and so they were a company that when the, uh, the Floyd uh, murder uh, occurred, um, a lot of companies came out and tried to express you know, condolences. Uh, and for most companies that did that, it went about as well as that can go. Uh, but for Adidas, it was snap. Uh, the minute they got behind the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the black employees in their company walked out. Uh, they had just taken that hypocrisy just too far. Uh, and the HR chief just, again, you'd like to think the HR chief could get in front of this, but the HR chief, um, Karen Parker, basically said that, uh, that there's no racism at Adidas. It, racism is only something they talk about in America and it's just noise. Um, well, two months later, she's gone, okay? Now, Adidas had three different campaigns 
that had to be pulled at the last minute because they were racially insensitive. Uh, they produced a shoe for black, uh, for um, a National Black Month in February that was an all white shoe that had to be called back. They had a shoe where James Harden was supposed to break out of a cage uh, as part of the Uncaged series, a tremendously insensitive image. Um, time and time again, they had marketing campaigns that failed because even though they were trying to represent themselves to African-American customers, they didn't have African-Americans where they needed to be in the organization. So I think the key is you need to have diverse representation for a lot of reasons. Part of it's legal. And if you want to get behind the legal things, we can talk about that too. But our book is about competitive advantage. It just makes you better, uh, better at everything that you do. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on it and there's going to be a lot of pressure on it. Uh, and if you can't, if you don't do it for the right reason, which is the business necessity reason, um, then again, you can be um, subject to legal action and we won't get into all that. We don't have a lot of detail for that. Um, but I will say when I get back to being your best self, uh, that you can do the right thing for the right reason or you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. But in the end, uh, you need to do the right thing. And that is my two o'clock appointment <laughs> calling me. Uh, and so I need to break away here for, for my two o'clock appointment. Uh, and I know that um, Marcella, you want this slide here. And Marcella will talk to you all about uh, upcoming events. Thank you. Yeah. So for those of you that are watching, Dr. Hollenbeck, thank you for your time today. We had a question from a former student who wanted to give you some um, praise on one of his classes. We'll save that and I'll just share with you that we had exact same students on the call or former students today. So tell that student, tell that student to email me. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. And then for those of you listening, thank you for joining us today. We have more to go in our series. The slide shows the next couple. Um, and if you need to know more, there's information on our website. So please join there. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and be your best self. Right, Dr. Hollenbeck? All right. Bye, everybody.